So I went on Hajj and I was there on Hajj, uh, standing on the plains of Arafah. I remember it was 50 degrees that day and I was standing under the shade of a lone tree in the desert and I had my hands raised to the sky and I was having a conversation with Allah and I was saying, Ya Allah, Allah, you have given me everything. Everything I could possibly ask for Allah, you have given me. You've given me health. I have no health issues whatsoever. You've given me wealth. I'm earning more than I know what to do with. You've given me intellect. You've given me this actuarial skill set that not many people possess. I'm lacking for nothing in my life, yes. Ya Rab. What will I say to you when you ask me what I did with it all? Yes. And I pictured myself on that day standing in front of him on that day and Allah saying, my servant, what did you do with all the ni'mah I've given you? Mm. And I pictured myself saying, Ya Allah, I bought a car. Yes. And I went on holiday mm. and that's all I did. And I've never been so afraid in my life. Imagine you've just lost your job. You're going through the hardest time in your life and the bank now comes and takes your property away mm. from you. For me, that should be criminal. Raza, first of all, Salaam alaikum. Welcome, Salaam. Thank you so much for being here. The founder of uh, FIDA. So uh, first of all, explain what is FIDA and what's the model? And how is it different from uh, many of the other products that exist in the Islamic finance space? Uh, yeah, well, thank you for having me. So FIDA, uh, first I'll go through the name and then I'll explain what it is we do. The word FIDA, it means the same in lots of different languages, Arabic, Urdu, Turkish, Persian, lots of different languages. It means benefit or goodness. Yes. Um, and uh, the, the P at the front stands for people because we like right. to always put people first in everything we do. So we really aim to be the people's father and uh, our strap line actually, you can see on my sleeve here, is for the people. What we do is we help people into halal home ownership based on Islamic finance principles where there's no debt involved whatsoever, no interest or riba involved whatsoever. So we help people to get into completely halal home ownership in a way that they are comfortable with their faith. Uh, whether it be for faith reasons or for any other reasons, people who don't want a mortgage or don't want an interest-based mortgage. Um, and we can get into the mechanics of that. Um, to, at a very high level, just explain the differences. Uh, first, you have to understand how the other products on the market work. So let's take a conventional mortgage. With a conventional mortgage, the bank lends you a sum of money. You now owe that money back to the bank with yes. interest over a set period of time. Uh, so that's a very simple loan agreement. A fixed However, amount of money, fixed period of time with a fixed return, effectively. It effectively, might be a bit although of the interest rate interest. might be variable. Right? So that's how a conventional mortgage product works. You've then got Islamic bank mortgages. Now with Islamic bank mortgages, the bank doesn't lend you the money directly. The bank buys the property. And what the bank then does is say to you, right, you must buy this property off of us over a set period of time for a fixed price. And on top of that, you must pay us rent as well. So uh, what you've got there is a... Uh, a combination of two contracts of sale. You've got one uh, contract of sale of the uh, ownership of the property, one contract of sale of the usage of the property, which is the rental side. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing there is actually creating a debt obligation with a payment on top of that debt obligation. And this splits opinions. So mm -hmm. some Sharia scholars have signed off on this approach. Um, and even they will quite often say, you know, it's until we've got a better uh, yes. approach. Uh, and some Sharia scholars are actually not happy with this approach because there is a general prohibition in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ told us not to combine two contracts of sale in one because uh, by doing that you can replicate the same outcome as riba. Uh, you've then got uh, what's called a shared ownership product where there's no debt involved whatsoever and where there's no debt there's effectively no riba. Mm -hmm. So with a shared ownership product, uh, which is how the Fiverr product operates, we buy the property as partners. So if you and I buy a property together, let's say we buy a car together, I haven't loaned you any money, you haven't loaned me any money, yeah. we both own, own that car together as partners. Now, if anything happens to that car, the true test of a partnership is who takes the risk. Yes. So if that car is destroyed, if I say to you, okay, Saj, you now have to buy my share of the car off mm -hmm. of me, then that's not really a partnership, mm -hmm. that's a debt, because I'm not really taking risk in the asset. Whereas if that car is destroyed and you take your share of loss and I take my share of loss, that is what defines a partnership. Yes. And that's one of the uh, things that we take to the next level at Pfizer. So the sharing of the risk and the reward. We share of the risk and the reward. Well, actually, uh, so the reward is the upside in the property appreciation. Yes. One thing we're very proud of at Pfizer is to make the product very affordable. And so what we do is we say whenever you're buying uh, shares in the property from us, we're going to continue selling to you at the original cost. Mm. 
because we know property prices in the UK go up 5 to 10% per annum. Most people's wages, if you're lucky, go up 1% to 2% per annum. Mm. So if we were to continuously revalue the property and sell to you at market value, it would be a carrot on a stick. You'd never quite yeah, be able to reach it. chasing it because of constant increase in prices that are happening in value, market values, you wouldn't reach that figure. Exactly, because mm. your wages aren't going up in line with the property value. So we took the decision early on, we'll make our money off the rental income that we charge instead, and the upside will gift um, to our customers to make it affordable. So what that means is we have the flexibility of a shared ownership model where you can literally, we've got an app, you can go into your app month to month and decide what you want to pay. This month, I just want to pay my rent, click and it's done. This month, I want to pay my rent and purchase some shares in the property, click and it's done. This month, I've saved up some money, I want to buy a large chunk of shares in the property and you can do what we call what if analysis mm -hmm. what if i buy a large chunk of shares what does it do to my term yes. what does it do to my total cost what does it do to my monthlies do i like that outcome yes. so you can make an informed decision so you've got all that flexibility that you get with a shared ownership type model but we've priced it so that it costs you no more than a conventional mortgage and that's nice. one thing we're very very proud of when setting up fire it was very important to me that there should be no quote unquote Muslim premium yes. or indeed no poverty premium. Yes. So the Muslim premium is where it costs you more to be Muslim and the poverty premium is where it costs you more to be poor. Mm. Um, and I didn't want that. I didn't want to have a product where just because you're Muslim, it costs you more to buy a home. That's yeah, so defeating the purpose. That's a common objection that you often see with Islamic finance that actually the uh, if I go and pursue an Islamic mortgage, the cost of that will be higher than say a traditional high street lender and I'm doing it for faith reasons because I want to avoid interest but I'm being penalized for for going down this route but let's just talk about why it's more expensive first of all so what's the reason Islamic finance is more expensive than a traditional mortgage yeah so on on the scale of things conventional mortgages tend to be the cheapest and that's because they're just straightforward debt debt is the cheapest form of finance that's sort of economics 101 yes. right now Islamic mortgages tend to cost a bit more shared ownership tends to cost significantly more mm -hmm. Islamic finance Islamic Islamic mortgage um Islamic bank mortgages tend to cost more than conventional mortgages simply because those banks are just not as big as the conventional banks yes. they, they don't, don't have the same have economies that region, of scale. yeah exactly so they can't raise capital as cheap as the conventional banks it's as simple as that yeah. now the problem with that is from a customer experience perspective it's no different really um, in terms of the experience it's still a debt-based obligation the outcomes are still very similar to a conventional product so you end up paying a premium but not really necessarily experiencing any difference in your worldly outcomes right yes, and that's so, one of the biggest problems so the just picking up on that uh, a little bit more and breaking down a little bit more that so sometimes people say it just replicates interest and they use another label or term but effectively i'm paying the same thing that's not quite correct however the as you said the outcome and the experience can feel similar exactly. uh, in terms of how it uh, how it works exactly we have to be very careful to understand that islamic bank products have been signed off by scholars reputable scholars um and so it's not right to say that it is just interest wrapped up in a different name but what is very clear is that the economic outcome is the same as interest yes. is the same as riba and actually even those very reputable scholars who sign off on these products uh, they will be the first to say look we signed off on these products not because they're perfect but because they are a step towards achieving a better outcome. Yes. And until we have a mainstream, more pure alternative, what, what we don't want to do is turn Muslims away from home buying, right? Yes. Because actually the detriment from Muslims no longer buying homes would be far greater because uh, home ownership is linked to wealth and it's linked to family relationships and it's linked to mental health. And at the moment, Muslim home ownership is declining faster than any other demographic in the UK. And that's something we need to turn around. So the scholars took a decision that actually, on the balance of pros and cons, it's far better to accept a less than perfect solution, mm -hmm. as opposed to just blanket decline it, because that would be far worse for the, for the Muslim community. Often the perception is you need a large amount of money to be able to get involved in property. Although that can be the case, it doesn't necessarily have to be. There are many, many different ways that you can make money from property. The biggest challenge is though, that many of them can't be done in a Sharia compliant way. There are, however, still some strategies and techniques that can be used to make significant profits from property. I've put together a short training for you that explains how you can make money from property in a halal and Sharia compliant way. Head over to the link, which is sajusain.com forward slash halal, and you can get the free training there. Now let's jump back to the podcast. And 
with uh, we're talking about the three different models. So you've got traditional finance, got Islamic finance, and shared ownership. So how is shared ownership different then to Islamic finance? And then Islamic finance, although we're achieving a similar outcome, is still working within a banking framework. So it still right. needs to some aspects need to function similar to how a bank functions. That's right. That's right. Um, so the key difference with shared ownership is that there is no debt and it's true risk sharing. It's a true partnership. Now, the benefit of a partnership is that actually both partners are on a completely equal footing. With a banking product, whether it's a traditional banking product or, a, or an Islamic banking product, because they are debt-based obligations, uh, the, the risk isn't truly shared. So the acid test, as I mentioned earlier, what happens if that property is destroyed? Right. So take the car example again, Satch. If you and I are in a car together and the car's destroyed, completely annihilated, and I say to you, Saj, you have to buy my share of the car from me now, what will you say to me? Mm. You'll say, there is no car. Yes. How can I buy it from you? I don't want to buy something that doesn't exist. And this is what happens even in the Islamic banking contract. Um, if that property is destroyed, the bank won't share in the risk of the asset. They will say, right, you must immediately buy our share from us, even though the property no longer exists. Now, we have to understand why they they have this clause is because ultimately they are operating within the banking system they are operating within that regulatory sphere and that system requires them to operate in this way yes. if you think about how a bank raises money to lend on mortgages uh, a bank has two key operations one is the uh, sort of bank account side the deposit side where people place their money to keep it safe and they use that money and they multiply it up through yes. a process called fractional reserving and they then use that money to lend on mortgages. Yes, because many people don't quite understand that when they put their money in the bank, it doesn't actually sit there for them. That's right. Multiples of that is created out of thin air to be then lent out, which is what banking is. Which which is actually the single biggest con <laughs> in economics. Yes. The whole banking system is built around this. And, and actually, we, we should delve into that. But um, the, the point is that because they're lending money on this fractional reserving system, they can only do that if they can guarantee getting that money back, which means they cannot take risk in the asset for reg regulatory reasons. So they have to impose this debt on their customers so that they can then guarantee the deposits back to their uh, yes. savings account customers and, and current accounts. The, the idea being that all the people that have placed their money in the bank will not request it all at the same time. Exactly. It's based on uh, a percentage will want it at this moment in time, hence a certain amount of liquidity needs to be available. But we've seen things in the past, even in this country and in places like America, when there's been a run on the bank, That's right. where there's been concerns about a bank and people wanting to withdraw their money and the bank are not being able to deliver because they don't actually have it. That's exactly right. So what, what many people don't realise is when you put £100 in your bank account, the bank will multiply that money up, literally create money out of thin air, and banks have a license to create money out of thin air. And for every £100 you deposit, the bank might lend £98 to somebody on a mortgage. Now, your bank balance still says £100, but somebody else now has £98 to buy a house with, so they've created £98 out of thin air. And what this does is it increases the supply of money in circulation. That then leads to inflation. Yes. When, when you increase money supply, you create inflation in the economy. So by... One of the things we need to get much better at doing as a community is not leaving wealth idle in bank yes. accounts, right? We need bank accounts. I'm not saying down with banks. We need bank accounts to pay for our daily day day to day spending. But leaving all of our savings in a bank account is the very worst thing we can do. You even hear people talk about I've left my money's in the bank, but I've, I said I don't want any interest. So they might feel that I'm doing something that I'm not accepting the interest, but actually just by leaving that money there, you are not really helping. The, well, you're, uh, actually, yourself or you're the actually contributing to a very negative outcome because by creating inflation in the economy, so first of all, when you save, put your savings in a bank account, you price yourself out of the very home you want to buy because mm. you are creating inflation yes. by letting the bank multiply up your money. And who does that affect the hardest? The poor, because yes. they have less money to begin with, so they get hit hardest by inflation. So the whole banking system actually widens the rich poor divide and this mm. is the big con of the banking system and again i'm not down with banks yes. at all but what i am saying is as a community it's so easy to invest now there are so many platforms out there that let you invest for very low risk uh you don't need to know anything about investing yes and we need to just skill up as mm. a community and start investing our wealth and actually islam demands this of us yes why do we pay zakat on idle wealth in a bank account because Allah demands us to circulate that wealth, yes. do something useful do something with it, with it. Yes. activate it. Yes. And Allah says, if you can't find something useful to do with your wealth, 
at least pay some of it to the poor. So at yeah. least the poor benefit from it. Whereas when you leave it in a bank account, you don't benefit from it. Mm. Nobody else benefits from it. The only person who benefits is the banker. That's yes. it, right? When you invest that wealth, you circulate it through the economy and everybody in the economy benefits. The whole economy grows and everybody from rich down to poor benefits from yes. that. And that is actually a far better use of wealth than just paying 2.5% on idle funds yes. to poor right? Because yes. when you circulate it, the poor benefit as well, but actually the whole economy benefits. So this is what actually Islam demands of us. As a community, we must get better at investing our wealth wisely. And it's incumbent upon us to seek that knowledge and learn how to invest yes. wisely. And we, by the way, just, um, we offer investment savings accounts as well. Yes. The way we fund homes is we have savings accounts, a bit like a bank, but they're not deposit-based, they're investment-based, yes. which means so there's no multiplication I of I want money. to come on to that in just a moment, but before we move on to that, I just want to explore banking a little bit more yeah, sure. first. So in terms of the way banking works, banking is really designed to put extreme wealth in the hands of a few people. That's right and not for the majority. It creates a system that we are effectively almost all forced to use because there's no other way. Uh, if you look at your 20 pound note, it's just a piece of paper or a piece of plastic that right. promises to pay. And we just all accept and agree that that's the case. And that's why it is of value, but otherwise it is of no value to anybody. It's just that it's a promissory note. But because banking is set up in the way it is in this country for so many uh, hundreds of years, uh, and when we think about Islamic finance and Islamic banking in this country, 30, 40 years ago, it didn't exist. There was nothing. So the first series of uh, Islamic finance and banking was how do we make it as compliant for us as Muslims within the framework of what already exists? But since then, things have evolved a little bit to try and find alternative ways to it. Um, so let's just talk about shared ownership a little bit more. Then I want to explore a little bit more about how your funding model works yeah, and sure. how it's different. Yeah, so shared ownership, um, it, it works on the principle of partnership. So it's a very different model to those banking models I've just talked about. With a shared ownership model, you buy the property as partners. Um, and the simplest way to think of shared ownership is imagine you're renting a property from a landlord, right? Mm -hmm. So your only obligation to your landlord is to pay your rent. There's no obligation to do anything else. Take care of the property, that's it. Now, you may go to your landlord at any point and say, you know what, I really like your property, can I buy it from you? And your landlord might say, yeah, sure, my property's worth £400,000, pay me £400,000, you can have it. Now, what a shared ownership model does is it takes that exact situation, but instead of your landlord saying, pay me £400,000 today, your landlord says, okay, maybe you don't have £400,000 in your pocket, um, and maybe you don't want to buy the full property from me, so why don't we become partners? So, instead of paying me £400,000, how much have you got in your pocket? Maybe... £40,000 as an arg for argument's sake, right? If you pay me £40,000, I will now transfer 10% of the ownership of the property to you. So you are now a 10% partner in the property, I'm a 90% partner, and we are partners. So now, because you're living in the property, you don't have to pay me rent on the full property value anymore, because you own 10% of the property. Yes. You're living, 10% of the property you're living in belongs to you, you're not going to pay rent to yourself. So instead of paying me rent on the full property, pay me rent on 90% of the property now. So your rent goes down as you increase your ownership. Yes. And this is what's called staircasing, right? So as you staircase up your ownership in the property, your rent goes down in line with the amount of equity you own. Now, the benefit of this is it's a very flexible model because you can literally uh, buy equity according to your means, according to life's ups and downs with no debt whatsoever. There's no obligation on you to buy out your partner, just like there's no obligation on you to buy out your landlord. It's offer an acceptance if you choose to do it. But you've just got the ability to do it gradually over time if you choose to do so. And you don't have to stick to any sort of staircasing levels. You can go higher and lower according to your needs. Now, with many shared ownership solutions, um, the, the major downside is it's prohibitively expensive in the long run. Mm -hmm. The reason being that uh, what most shared ownership providers will do is they'll revalue the uh, property every time you want to buy equity. So they might give you uh, a once a year opportunity or maybe twice a year opportunity to buy equity from them in the property. And when you do choose to do so, they'll revalue the property. And as the property value increases, they will charge you the current market price. Um, now the problem your, with- Your share, your value of your share has increased as well, but because it's a minority share and they have a majority share, you're effectively now having to pay more to buy into uh, uh, another slice as it were. That's right. So every time you want to buy more from the landlord, you will have to pay in line with what the current market price is. And the property value, as we said, 
you know, might go up five to 10% per annum. So it becomes more and more expensive over time to get to full home ownership. And that's the problem with shared ownership. It becomes prohibitively expensive over time. So most shared so ownership- Just as, sorry, as a clarification, um, so products that are, or properties that are available, for example, on right move, somebody sees and this is available for share ownership. Are we talking about that or uh, those based around Islamic finance or combination of the two of the same? So generally um, shared ownership is offered uh, by housing associations and local authorities on certain properties. So you'll have a smaller stock of properties to choose from if you want a shared ownership solution. There are now shared ownership providers available like by the, mm -hmm. there's others as well, like Way Home and Your Home, um, where you can, um, with some providers, they have a pool of properties they've pre-selected, you choose from one of them. With some providers like us, you choose the property, any property you want, yes. and you can enter a shared ownership type partnership with them. And some of the properties that we see available for shared ownership for sale, they might have a traditional funding method behind them as well, interest-based, just for clarity purposes. Yeah, so so um, quite often what you'll do with a shared ownership provider, so a shared ownership uh, offer provided by a local authority, for example, might say, right, uh, you'll have a 25% shared ownership deal with us, but the remaining 75% you have to get a traditional mortgage yes. on, right? So you won't necessarily... Be able to staircase up to 100 yes, so percent through shared. I just ownership. wanted to clarify that because it's when we're talking about shared ownership in terms of how that works. That's the traditional model. Yes, but now models like uh, ours and some of the others I've mentioned let you staircase up yes. all the way. So let me understand then. Let's say as a potential homeowner, if I want to use a FIDA to purchase a property, um, let's say the property is two hundred thousand yep. pounds. Um, talk me through the the process. How much I would need? How the structure uh, would work? Yeah, so the process is very similar to a mortgage. So uh, we'll do an affordability assessment, see what your property budget is, and then you'll go and find a property in line with your budget. Uh, once you've found a property, we'll do the full application and we'll do affordability checks and background credit checks and ID checks and all the stuff that a bank would normally do. Now we normal place prudent checks you would uh, normal prudent do, checks. Yeah. So, for example, if somebody was uh, made bankrupt last year, it would not make financial sense to enter into a partnership with them. So it's That's a common right. sense approach. So we'll do normal prudent checks. Now, some of our customers we find have a very poor credit rating, but it's not because they are bad credit. It's because mm -hmm. they've just never taken out a credit card. Yes. And that's a really important point. Uh, exactly. That you, and I think maybe just emphasize that point because uh, what a credit file is is a demonstration on your ability to borrow and repay. That's right. But if you say, no, I don't get involved in any form of uh, borrowing, well, your credit file, when it's open, there's nothing in it to look at. That's right. So effectively, that gives you a low score because there's nothing to look at. It, it, exactly that. So this is one thing we take into account in our underwriting assessment. We will look at customers' credit files, but if a customer has a low credit rating, we'll seek to understand why is it low. And if it's just because they've never borrowed in their life, we don't hold that against yeah. our customers. Actually, many of our customers just don't want to borrow and don't want to pay interest yes. because ultimately we're an Islamic finance institution. So then we'll look at a, uh, a pure affordability assessment and we'll say, right, well, what is your income? How much are you earning? What are your outgoings? How much of your outgoings are, um, you know, things which you just can't reduce? How many are luxuries which you could reduce if yes. you wanted to? And we'll come up with a reasonable assessment of without a major detriment in your standard of living, what's the most you could afford to buy with us, right? And then, uh, you know, for some customers, the credit score won't won't even play into it at all. For some, we will look at the credit score as well if they've got a credit score for us to look at. Okay, so that's the application process. And uh, so you, it seems like you're taking much more of a, a human and a common sense approach rather than Sorry. just key all the data into the computer. Computer says yes, computer says no exactly. type approach. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then assuming the affordability checks pass, what we'll do is we'll get the property surveyed. Okay. So again, as your partner, we want to make sure that this is a good property for you to raise your family in. Yes. So, we, so whereas a bank will just get the property valued, what's the value of the property? Is it good collateral for our loan? Yes. They don't care about the status of that property. We will look at the state of the property and we'll point out to you, actually, you know what? This property has major damp issues mm. and the timbers are rotting and you don't want to raise your family in this property, yes. right? Um, or we'll say, actually, this is a really good property. Mm -hmm. And as partners, it makes sense for us to enter this partnership together because you want to raise your family here. We know the roof isn't going to collapse tomorrow and cause a loss for both of us. So we'll do that 
enhanced assessment that most banks wouldn't do. Yeah. So and when that, a survey normally is done by the bank, as you touched on earlier, that it's it's really just to ensure that their money is safe in that property. That's right. If if you are unable to pay and they have to repossess that property, they're able to recover their money. That's really their only concern at exactly that point. That. So the survey that comes out to do that valuation, that report on that property, that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for the quality of the property or the quality of accommodation, which is what you're referring to exactly as right. an enhanced survey. And that's something where we really look out for our customers. And sometimes it's a tough conversation because we've had clients in the past where we've said to them, you know what, the electrics in this property are really dangerous. Mm. We're not comfortable taking yes. on this property because, you know, this property could burn to the ground any minute. Yes. And we'd expect our customers to to like that we're yes. doing this. But sometimes a customer will say, no, I really want this property. Yeah. Why are you blocking emotion, me from buying right? this They're property? Emotional and it becomes emotional. It, yeah. And we have to be very firm in that respect because we know that buying a property is a very emotional yes. um, uh, journey. And sometimes it's easier for us to take that independent perspective and say, listen, you really don't want to raise yes. your family in this property, right? Sometimes it's easier for us to do that than for our customers. Sometimes we have to be the bad guy. Yes. And, and we have to just put our foot down and say, we're not going into this partnership with yes. you because it's not it's not a good investment for you. It's not sensible, yeah. yeah. Uh, and sometimes we just have to be the bad guy there. But that is part of being an ethical yes. Islamic provider. We have to do right by our customers. At the because end when the we talk about ethical finance, Islamic finance, firstly, it's just not just for, for Muslims, just to be clear. That's that, right. uh, but it's based on Islamic principles. And the key objective is to stay away from interest and riba. But the whole model needs to be ethical and fair, which is what we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, I was in an Islamic finance roundtable the other day and we were talking about how can we take Sharia compliance to the next level? Mm. So there's Sharia compliance ticking the boxes, but what's the point of having a Sharia compliant product if all of your funding in the background is interest-based yes. debt and you're treating your employees like dirt and you're polluting the environment? Yeah, you've got a Sharia compliant yes. product, but are you actually meeting the muqasid, the higher mm. principles of Sharia? And that's where as an industry, we really need to take Sharia yes. compliance now. We need to make sure that as operators, we are, uh, you know, an example to other providers, yes. showing the true meaning of Sharia compliance rather than just ticking the boxes. Mm. Because that's how we'll, uh, you know, help society to realize that Islam actually has a really beautiful answer yes. to finance. Take, take, you know, one, one strap line I like to give for the FIDA model is imagine you could buy a home pay no more than you'd pay elsewhere, but never be in debt, mm. have complete flexibility over your payments, and never have to worry about the roof over your head. Yes, That is a beautiful proposition that should appeal to everybody, right? Absolutely. It shouldn't just be for Muslims. Yes. Why, would no, why would anybody not want that, regardless of faith, right? And that's just the product. Then take on top of that, and we treat our uh, staff really well, mm. and we make sure that we're uh, looking after the environment. One thing I'm really keen to introduce at Fiverr is a sort of uh, scheme to help our customers reduce their carbon footprint. Okay. Not because we need to do it. Yes. It won't make us any more money, but it's the right thing to do, yes. right? We need to make Britain's homes cleaner so we're polluting less and we're looking after the world that we're living in yes. because this world is an amana from Allah. Yes. We have to look after Absolutely. it. Otherwise, how are we going to answer him yes. when we say, you know, we, we released loads of carbon gases and destroyed the atmosphere and destroyed this beautiful earth you've given us. Yes. That is incumbent upon us as Muslims to do these things, go the extra mile. It's not just about whether it makes business sense. It's yes. about whether it makes Islamic sense to do it. Absolutely. And I think the holistic approach is important to emphasize that it's not about trying to make one thing work, like how do we avoid interest? It's how the, the whole building the whole picture. So once a, a survey's been done, you've got a valuation report uh, that's come back. Um, and what, what are the next steps? What happens then at that point? Yeah, so assuming the survey comes back clean and there's no issues, uh, then we'll move on to conveyancing mm -hmm. where the solicitors get involved and do all the legal paperwork and everything. They'll do a few more searches at that point as well. Um, and then... So far it sounds like just a normal traditional purchase, what you would do in any other Very similar purchase. process okay. to a conventional mortgage. And then we'll move through to exchange and completion, which is where you get the keys to the property and you yes. can actually move in with your family. Yes. So the process is very similar, but the differentiator is the actual agreement itself. Okay. The flexibility in the agreement, the app-based infrastructure, yes. the fact that you're never in debt. And we've also got, uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, never having to worry about the roof over your head. What mm -hmm. do I mean by that? So let's take a conventional mortgage where you're paying a thousand pounds per month, which is your interest plus your capital repayment. Yes. And actually it's very similar for an Islamic bank mortgage. Right. Now, 
in a given month, your car broke down, you had to pay the mechanic, you've only got £800 in your pocket, you're now in default, right? So the bank might give you a couple of months yes. to make good on that default. They probably charge you interest in between on the shortfall. And within a couple of months, if you can't make good on that, you know, they're very likely to take your home away from you yes. and sell it. And because they're the finance provider, they get first call on any sale proceeds. Yeah. So if this property sells for 100,000 and you owe 100,000, they get all of that 100,000 and you get nothing. Yeah. Right? The objective is not to achieve the highest price. The objective is to get their money back. Precisely. So there's a massive conflict of interest yes. when they sell it. They have no incentive to sell it for the best price, just to sell it for an amount that recovers the debt yes. that you owe. Right? Now, imagine you've just lost your job. You're going through the hardest time in your life and the bank now comes and takes your property away mm. from you. For me, that should be criminal. Yes, because you're at the lowest point anyway, you have another kick in the stomach. In your life. I think it should be criminal for the bank to now mm. take your home away from you. Now, what we have is the notion of an equity buffer, right? When you actually are buying equity with us, you're actually getting share certificates, proof of ownership. And so what you can do in times of difficulty, first of all, you've got the breathing room. You can just pay rent if you want. So you've yes. got massive breathing room. So you can room reduce your, your payment down to say this month, uh, I can't uh, uh, afford to buy anymore. I'm just going to pay the rent element. Exactly. So okay. you've got massive breathing room there. But now let's say you've lost your job, you can't afford to pay a rent. Well, what you can do is rely on what we call your equity buffer. You've okay. got equity in the property. You can sell some of that equity back that would to be us. Some of the money you put in originally, maybe plus some increase in value as well. Exactly. So you can sell some of that equity back to us to cover the rent that you owe. Right. And that so means you reduce you've covered your, your share rent. effectively. Yes. Right. Exactly that. Give you more breathing space. Exactly that. So now you can treat your property a bit like a bank account, right? You can dip in and out of yes. it, top it up when you've got the means to top it up, and draw from it yes. when you need more money, right? Which you can't do with a normal bank yes. mortgage. Uh, and this is for any life event, not just if you're facing difficulties. We've had customers take money out from their property um, to pay for weddings and mm. things like that because it's like a bank account yes. now, right? So what this means is uh, in that time of difficulty, whereas you might get two months payment holiday with a bank, our average customer, if they have 10% equity and they lose their job on day one, that 10% equity buffer will last our average customer around two to four years. Right. So right. that's huge security. Yes. So that the last thing you have to worry about when you've lost your job is, God, how am I going to pay the mortgage? Yes. You know you've got the roof over your head. You can focus on what's important, yes. getting back on your feet, finding another job, starting to make your payments again. Because we know our customers don't yes. want to lose their homes. We know they will, they're they going to do everything in their power to get another job and start yes. making payments again because it's their it's home. Their home. Yes. So it just relies on that trust and yes. that... Um, you know, that that partnership based approach being in it together. Yes. And that is the beauty of the model that we've created. It's a true partnership. It sounds like it absolutely makes sense. And when you think about that, we think, why don't banks operate in that way? But I guess their agenda is very different. Their objective is how do we create the maximum amount of profit exactly. for the lender, as opposed to what's a fair model that would work to allow home ownership to, uh, to happen. And also with the banking model, because it's based on leverage, that money multiplier fraction yes. reserving it allows them to do more volume, mm. right? Whereas our model doesn't multiply money at all. Yes. So it just works on the existing money supply. Now that naturally means our model is going to grow slower, yes. but it's a much more stable, resilient, fairer model that protects both sides of the equation. Whereas when you have a leveraged model, it creates more volatility and that is riskier for both sides of the equation. Yes. And in terms of the, the time frame, how long somebody has to repay that, does that work like a traditional mortgage, a 10, 20, 30 year mortgage? How does that work? Not at all. So with us, there is no set time frame. Okay. Uh, and it's the same with any shared ownership model, right? So uh, you may tell us, I want to fully own my home after 25 years. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is we'll do the maths for you and we'll say, okay, to achieve your goal, here's how much equity you'd need to purchase from us every right. month. And our, our policy is whenever you want to buy equity from us, we'll sell it to you. Yes. Right? The landlord might say, actually, I don't want to sell my property yeah. to you. Our policy is whenever you want to buy from us, we'll sell it to you. Right? Mm -hmm. So we'll say, here's how much you'd need to buy from us every month to achieve your goal. But that is just a target. You don't have to stick to it. There's no obligation whatsoever. You can go higher, lower, throw it out the window and just pay rent. Entirely up to you. Mm -hmm. And our app shows you all the projections so you can right. make informed decisions as well. Um, and so if you stick to that target, after 25 years, you'll be the full owner of the home. Yes. If you don't stick to that target, you might take longer. You might take 27 years. Yes. You might take 23 years. Or you might just decide, actually, I own 50% of the property. I'm quite comfortable just renting 50% for the rest of my life. Yes. So it's completely So flexible. there's no compulsion. It's more of a target you set that this is what Precisely. we're aiming to do as opposed to has to. And there's no pressure from you as the finance provider. None whatsoever. That that's how it's going to work. There's no 
late penalties, no early penalties like you get okay. with a debt because there yes. is no debt. So there's no such thing as early or late. Yes. It's just in the app, you can say, actually, I want to buy more equity this month or actually, I don't want to buy any equity this month. Mm -hmm. So there's actually no such thing as early or late. It's yes. just up to you if or when you decide you want to buy equity in the home. Yes. So let's talk about the the other side of the uh, the, the coin, if you like, is how you are able to fund all these uh, purchases and these acquisitions. Is there a huge vault with uh, billions of pounds sitting there waiting for you to... I, I wish to there do. was. Um, so actually, we operate very similarly to a bank, but we're like a new age building society or okay. almost like a cooperative. And actually, cooperative is probably the closer example because Fiverr is actually owned by our customers yeah. and our investors. And even though we're... Uh, a shareholder owned company, we've only ever offered shares, apart from one exception, very small exception, um, to our customers and investors, first and foremost, yes. because we want our um, interest to be completely aligned, yes. not riba interest. Yes. Uh, you know, yes. uh, we, want, we want our purpose to be completely aligned. That's how we ensure we're a true partnership in it together. So, so based on a cooperative principle, even though the structure is not a, a, a co-op as such. So the way it works is um, just like a bank or a cooperative, uh, we have savings accounts and people place money in those savings accounts, but our savings accounts are not the same as bank accounts. Okay. They're actually more like investment accounts. Right. So what what happens is when people place money in those bank accounts, oh, sorry, they're not bank accounts. When people place money in those investment savings accounts, mm -hmm. that is the money we use to fund homes. Right. And now we give our savers a profit share on the rental income that we're making. Right. So it's the most okay. halal yes. uh, methodology you could possibly yes. think of, right? So there's no, uh, like, with if we try to think about when we put money into the bank, a traditional bank, what happens to that money, there's a lot of complexity in that goes bank. on in the background. Yeah. Uh, and most people are completely oblivious to what that process right. is and what happens. Um, and which is the bank's benefit because they, the most people assume the money's just sitting in the bank. I can just go and, uh, I can just go and get it. That's right. Which isn't the case. Even these days, if you try to withdraw a thousand pounds, they say, "Well, you have to give us notice. We don't have any money That's right. here." That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, even though it's your money. Yes. And actually, you know, that whole banking system is opaque for a reason. It's because banks have carte blanche to do whatever they want with your money, right? As long as they're holding a reserve. Yes. And depending on what they're doing with your money, they might have to hold a slightly bigger reserve. They can go and take huge risk with your money if they want to. Yes. And if that risk and many pays have off, done in the past, especially. yeah, exactly. Yes. It's not paid off for many in the past. But if it pays off. They take all the benefit of yes. that, even though they've used your money to take yes. that risk. They take all of the reward. They give you a tiny sliver of interest um, on your bank. And if it doesn't pay off, and if it causes the bank to collapse, guess who takes the loss? Yes. The the people, because the, the government will bail them out. <laughs> the, the taxpayers yes. bail them out. Which is what happened to Lloyds Bank, effectively, uh, and various RBS, others at the time. Yes, yes. that's right. Yes. That's right. Um, so, so, when, so when the bank takes risk with your money, you are exposed to all the risk but they take all the reward. Yes. It's the most heinous system you can yes. possibly imagine. Our savings accounts are very transparent. Your money is only ever used for one purpose, which is to fund homes in a completely halal methodology, and you get a straightforward profit share on those homes. Yes. So it's very, very simple, transparent. So it's an investment account to put in money in. So for example, let's say I was putting 10,000 pounds into an investment account. That 10,000 pound thing goes off to purchase, uh, contributes to one property, or is it kind of dispersed? It's or? pooled across all okay. of our properties. So, so the it other mitigates benefit, the risk as well. Exactly. Yeah. So if you've got 100,000 pounds, you might use that to buy a property, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, we don't tend to think of risk when we buy a property. It's bricks and mortar, safest yes. houses and all that. But there is risk, there just like with any risk, investment. Yeah. If that property It's a lower risk, but there is risk. It's lower risk. Yes. But if that property is blown into the sea yes. and the insurance fails for whatever reason, you've lost your 100,000, right? Now, in our portfolio, it's the same thing. It's bricks and mortar. We don't often hear of properties being destroyed. We don't often hear of insurance failing, yeah. it's but it can happen. Rare, yes. It's exceptionally rare, but it can happen. But now, if you're pooling that risk across all of our property portfolio, mm. Now you're spreading your eggs, so they're not yes. all in one basket. So yes. now, even if that worst case scenario did happen to a property, if that property is worth 1% of our portfolio, yes, there will be a loss. But instead of losing £100,000, it will only be a 1% loss. Yes. And that will net off against the return you're getting in the right. form of your profit shares as well. Okay. So you're spreading your eggs. Yes. So the, the reward I'm getting for parking my money into this uh, uh, investment uh, savings uh, scheme is effectively, it's not interest, 
because the money's not being lent. That's right. It's a share of the rent that's being collected. It's just a simple share of the rent right. that we're making. Exactly. Okay. And the rent we charge is genuine rent. Yes. It's not pegged market to interest rent. rates or anything yeah. like that. It's based predominantly on market rent uh, with some commercial considerations. So market rent isn't exact science. That yes. It will be a range. Yeah. So there's some commercial considerations in there. But it's pegged to market rent. It's reviewed once a year in line with property movements, okay. not pegged to interest rates whatsoever. So it's genuine rent we're charging. Yes. And you're just getting a profit share on that genuine rent that we're charging. It's as halal and straightforward as you could possibly yes. ask. It seems like to me, Raza, what you've done is looked at how can we purchase property uh, based on core principles of kind of fairness and uh, in an ethical way, rather than thinking about what's the framework that I need to work within. Exactly. Come up the model and think, okay, now how can I create this within the legal framework of the uh, the country we live in. That's exactly it. What we've done okay. is build from the ground up yes. rather than trying to look at existing products and trying to see how we can halalify them. Yes. We've just built a brand new model. Yes. And actually one thing I'm very proud of, so I've got a, a partner in the business, my mm -hmm. co-founder, Salman, he's a Sharia scholar himself. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I'm very proud of, I think we're probably one of the only Islamic financial institutions in the world, maybe even the only Islamic financial institution in the world, where one of the founders is themselves a Sharia scholar. Yes. So everything we've built has been based on Sharia principles. Whereas what you quite often find is the product will be built first, yes. the infrastructure will be built first, and then you'll parachute in a scholar yes. to provide that to get Sharia approval. oversight yes. who will never have as detailed an understanding yes. of all the intricacies yes. as my co-founder who's been there since the beginning yes. and helped to build it himself. So that's something I'm that's very, very proud of. That is very unique. Mm. So tell me about uh, how did this come about then? You know, it, was it a case of, a, was this a childhood uh, dream or was it a one day you woke up and thought this one to do or what was the transition? How did this come quite, about? Quite the opposite actually. So uh, a bit about myself. Yes. I'm an actuary. Actuaries are complex statistical modelers. Um, there's not many of us. So yes. some of you so mostly views. work for like um, uh, banks, insurance companies to help them understand risk and, and exactly. manage money. So, so, okay. what, so what I used to do was I used to work across the London financial markets. Mm -hmm. I worked for insurance companies. I worked for consultancies like PwC. I worked for the Bank of England for a while. Okay. And I used to quantify risk, right? I was what's called a capital modeling actuary. Right. So my job was to build very complex computer models to model risk. And I'd uh, run models that run thousands and thousands of simulations looking at all the different risks an entity is exposed to. So for an insurance company, they don't know how many claims they're going to get, yes. so I'd model that out. They don't know what their investment portfolio is going to do, so I'd model that out. They don't know what their operational risks are, so I'd model that out. And I'd model all the dependencies between them and come up with a confidence interval of how much capital they need to hold yes. to be 99.5% confident that they're never going to go insolvent, right? Yes. So, so this is all the, all the premiums they collect, how much of that they need to keep as cash in order to pay out. And that's based on uh, previous history of data and stuff and, and modelling that you're doing. So that, that was your role. Correct, okay. correct. But, but looking at the absolute tail extreme risks that right. they know they're not going to go insolvent more than, you know, a one in 200 year yes. kind of scenario, yes. right? That's why insurance companies are so profitable. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. So now, so that's what I used to do. Now, it, some of your viewers may have never heard of an actuary and that's because there's not many of yes. us, right? And now as a result of that, actuaries tend to be very, very well paid because there's not many of us and we're very high in demand. Mm. So I used to work in the London financial markets all my life, very well paid in a role I was extremely good at. I loved it, loved what I did, and I progressed through my career very rapidly, alhamdulillah. And there were points in my career, I'll tell you, Saj, alhamdulillah, where I was earning more money than I knew what to do with. I was very, very blessed in my career. I had no reason to leave it. And um, I could never have imagined actually working for myself. I always yeah. thought, that's too risky for me. I was going to say, an actuary said... <laughs> An entrepreneur don't seem to uh, no. sit on the same... Actuaries uh, are risk-averse by nature. Yes. That's what we're paid to do. We're yes. paid to look at the worst-case scenarios, and that's where we live in the tail risk, right? So I could never have imagined that. But I'll tell you a story about when I was working at the Bank of England, um, and I was sat next to a chap called Elliot Luciani Kane, 20-something-year-old, new graduate, okay. non-Muslim guy. And I was actually boasting to him, Serge, and I was saying, you know, Elliot, we actuaries make a ton of money, and my plan is by the time I'm 40... I'm going to own a property portfolio and retire off of the rental income. And Elliot, this 20-something-year-old non-Muslim guy, wagged a finger in my face and he said, Raza, you know, what you're doing, that's fine, you can do that. But it's um, potentially going to, you know, deepen the housing crisis we're already in, mm. right? Whereas what you have a responsibility to do with an actual skill set is fix it. 
right? right. Now, he didn't say you have the ability to fix it. He yes. said you have a responsibility wow. to fix it. Yes. And I, his finger wagging struck yes. me like a ton of bricks. And I thought, God, he's actually yes. schooling me in Islam, yes. right? Allah's given me a skill set. I have a responsibility to do some good with that yes. skill set. So that sort of planted the seed in my mind. And later that year, subhanAllah, guess, guess what? I went on Hajj. Allah invited me to his home. So I went on Hajj and I was there on Hajj. Uh, standing on the plains of Arafah, I remember it was 50 degrees that day, and I was standing under the shade of a lone tree in the desert, and I had my hands raised to the sky, and I was having a conversation with Allah, and I was saying, Ya Allah, Allah, you have given me everything. Everything I could possibly ask for, Allah, you have given me. Mm. You've given me health. I have no health issues whatsoever. You have given me wealth. I'm earning more than I know what to do with. You've given me intellect. You've given me this actuarial skill set that not many people possess. I'm lacking for nothing in my life, yes. Ya Rab, what will I say to you when you ask me what I did with it all? Yes. And I pictured myself on that day, standing in front of him on that day, and Allah saying, my servant, what did you do with all the ni'mah I've given you? Mm. And I pictured myself saying, Ya Allah, I bought a car. Yes. And I went on holiday, mm. and that's all I did. And I've never been so afraid in my life. Mm as that day when I was having a conversation with Allah and picturing myself in front of him. Yes. And I remember just repeating again and again, Ya Allah, what will I say to you? Ya Allah, what will I say to you? Ya Allah, what will I say to you? And I get emotional every time I tell this story mm. because I remember crying like I've never cried in my life. In yeah. this 50 degrees heat, without any exaggeration, Wallahi, there was a puddle in the sand around my feet. Yeah. I've never shed so many tears in my life. I've never trembled so hard in my life and I've never been so afraid in my life as that moment when I was picturing myself in front of my Lord trying to answer that question. And I remember thinking, Ya Rab, I am ashamed and afraid to stand in front of you on that day because I don't have a good, good response. Yes. And I remember thinking, I have to try and do something to change that. And that was the moment that shifted my mind, completely shifted my perspective in life okay. and made me realise that I wanted to just have a better answer. I wanted yes. to at least be able to say, Ya Rab, I tried. Maybe I failed, but at least I tried. And so I came back from Hajj. I ended my role at the Bank of England. Okay. And I thought, right, what can I do? And I thought about That's doing It's quite a, a big, uh, dramatic change then. It's a um, huge... Because sometimes we have these reflections and we we question, you know, on the day of judgment, we're going to get questioned, how did you lead your life? And everything you were blessed with, what did you do? Exactly. I served myself. What about everybody else? Exactly, exactly. What did you do? And very few then take action on that. So it's amazing that you made that huge decision. People say going on Hajj is a life-changing experience. Yes. You only understand what that means when you go on Hajj. Yes. So for anyone watching who hasn't been be on Hajj... Of this in 2014, uh, I went to a Hajj and my life completely changed after absolutely, that. Absolutely, absolutely. Your whole perspective on life yes. changes. You realise how uh huge this universe is yes. and how infinitesimally yeah. small yes. you are yes. and how there is just a much greater purpose and going on hajj gives you a chance to reflect yes. on that subhanallah so I, I you know i initially thought about doing charity work and yeah. i realized maybe that's not my calling Probably the logical thing that comes to mind i should yeah. serve others exactly i should do charity work exactly yes. that's right but then i realized there's lots of great charities lots of people doing great work maybe not how i can utilize my skill set yes. and then i rewound that conversation with elliot and i thought right the housing market what can i do here how can i help particularly muslims who are very financially excluded yes. get into home ownership in a way they're completely comfortable with and at that point i'd never picked up an islamic finance text in my life mm -hmm. But I knew finance and I knew finance really well. And so I just used a pure common sense approach and I started building the product that we have today. And I actually drafted the legal documents myself, sitting wow. at my desk at home. Um, and then I built the pricing model using this actuarial risk-based approach where I modeled thousands of simulations and come up with a different range of outcomes. Um, I came up with a schematic for what I want the tech platform to look like. And then over time, we had volunteers joining us. SubhanAllah, Fida, I say it often, was built by the community, for the community. Yes. And actually, I, I want to get into how I built Fida as well, because I think that's really important for your viewers to hear. But um, for the first five years, we completely bootstrapped, no external funding whatsoever. Okay. And the reason we were able to achieve that, we got to the point where we were funding homes, we had a fully built tech platform, right. had all of our legal agreements fully vetted and drafted without any external funding. The reason we were able to do that is because the community rallied around us, okay. right? And the community, uh, we had people coming up to us saying, I love what you're building, let me know yes. how I can help. Yes. And we had a team- It's of, amazing, you're unique what you're doing. 
well, what we're doing is solving a real problem, yes. right? We're genuinely solving a problem that touches almost everybody you can think of, yes. right? Home ownership is so important. Um, and so we had a team of five developers, software developers, building out our tech platform for us completely voluntarily right. on their evenings and weekends alongside their full-time roles. Wow. And we had, um, when I say the community, I don't just mean Muslims, by the yes. way. We had um, barristers, you know, the top lawyers in the land, giving us legal opinions. There's one gentleman who I'll be forever grateful to. His name's David Southern, one of the top tax barristers in the land. And, you know, we were getting quotes uh, for 30,000, 50,000 pounds, which we just didn't have because yes. we weren't funded at that point. This is for them to give a legal opinion on how you will be structuring the business because exactly. you need that guidance. To make sure it's yes. enforceable and watertight and all that, right? Um, and, you know, we were getting these quotes and we went to David Southern and we said, look, we don't have much money, but this is what we're building. Can you help us out? And these guys are already at the top of their game. They've yes. earned their money. Yes. And for him, it was academic. And he said, you know what? This is really interesting. I just find this quite exciting. He gave us that same legal opinion for £2,000 that others were charging £50,000. This is what I mean when I yes. say FIDA was built by the community for the yes. community. And for anyone watching, some of your viewers might want to build property empires or yes. might be entrepreneurial. You know, the key bit of advice I can give is we have a very strong community. Yes. And all you need to do is find out how to unite hearts and minds. And if you can unite Absolutely. hearts and minds, there's nothing you can't achieve. And FIDA itself has been built purely through community funding. As I say, we're community owned. Yes. I have successfully raised north of 50, million, north of 50 million pounds for FIDA purely through community funding, wow. right? No venture funding, so no is, bank funding, this is just no to be clear, debt. This is just going into the community saying, this is what we're doing. You want to get involved you raised 50 million pounds doing that and that was at the start when you started that, that's from start to now wow. so some of that is operational capital to run the business yes. the greater chunk of that is the money that comes in through our savings accounts okay. which we use to then fund homes yes. right i call that all community funding yes right um so all of that has been done without any bank funding. There's no debt in our business model whatsoever. Okay. So no it's lending. not that in the background, there's some big bank that's lent you the money no. from the Middle East or anything to say, no. hey, I'll go on and set this. It's all being created from, as you said, grassroots from the community. And this is, you know, I, I, I call this the baraka that Allah yes. has placed in this business because we're genuinely trying to solve a problem here. And this is all just, uh, wallahi, I can't tell you, this is not because we're clever. It's not because we're particularly exceptional. It's because it's come to us. Yes. People have found us and said, I want to support you. Mm. And you and I were talking before we started yes. recording and you said, I hadn't really heard of Fiverr before. You don't yes. do much marketing. And we've not done any marketing. Mm. And this is what we've achieved. Because yes. when you're solving a genuine problem, the community become your biggest advocates and they do all the marketing for you. And all of this is organic word of mouth traction. Yes. So subhanAllah, you know, when you're solving a problem and you're doing it for a greater purpose i've seen with my own eyes how allah helps and he yes. he just he just supports you and why wouldn't he if you're yes, doing it to please him clean, yes. why wouldn't he why wouldn't he support you so that's the biggest advice i can give to any of your viewers whether it's building a business or building a property empire yes. or whatever it is you want to do make sure you're doing it with the right intention yes. make sure you're trying to genuinely create good out of it and i know what you do creates a lot of good you create homes for people you create wealth for people you're creating real good yes. with what you do Serge. And that's why I think Allah's placed a lot of barakah in what you do as well. Okay. So in terms of your vision for FIDA, how do you see this evolving, growing? And just help us understand the timelines in terms of when you started the first uh, home you helped fund and how many you've funded since then. Yeah, so, I mean, as I said, when I initially started this, I did it very grudgingly. I didn't do it because I saw a business opportunity. I did it because I felt I had a real responsibility, right? And actually my intention originally was um, if I can fund two homes out of my life savings, right? Fund two homes, help two families to genuinely avoid riba. Yes. Then I can say to Allah, Ya Allah, I did something, right? And this is essentially you thinking, I'll use my own funds to help launch Correct. something like this. Correct. Okay. I thought with my life savings, I can fund two homes and then I can go back to being an actuary again and I can go back to doing what I'm really good at and what yes. I'm making loads of money at. That was my intention. Okay. And I think that, Saj actually made me a good founder because I'm doing this, you know, once I did one or two properties, I fell in love with it. And that sense of fulfillment, I'm not earning anywhere near what I used to earn yes. in the city, but I'm a thousand times more fulfilled, right? And I could never even dream of going back to the city now because I just love what I do. Um, and so I'm doing this not because of 
identifying a business opportunity, not because of being able to make lots of money from it. Yes. I'm doing this because I feel a genuine sense of responsibility. And I think that's what makes me a good founder, right? But now we're at the point where, first of all, we're way further than I could have ever imagined. I had a okay. plan of doing two homes. Early, at the very start of this year, Alhamdulillah, we funded our 100th home. Oh, no. We're now, inshallah, by the end of the year, hoping to hit about 150, something like that. So we're that's at very, about- Very fast growth. Alhamdulillah, you know, we're, we're growing. We're not growing as fast as if we were taking on debt lines and yes. leverage and, uh, you know, interest yes. bearing. Considering capital. you're raising money from the community, as you said, you're not borrowing money. That's, uh, you know, achieving 150 homes uh, is uh, an amazing achievement. Alhamdulillah, you know, by the end of the year, inshallah, I'm hoping we'll have about a 50 to 60 million pound portfolio, mm -hmm. which is way beyond what I could have imagined yes. at the start. Um, and the, the key thing is we're doing it on our terms. When, you know, I'm not going and taking on capital that's going to dilute the yes. vision. The vision is front and centre in everything we're doing at Fire, and that's really, really important to me. So we're growing, you know, what that does mean is that we have a waiting list. People can't just come and get funded straight away. Yes. And that is a source of frustration for our yes. customers. Because Completely the, understand the model me. you use to fund those is you you raising money from the community in the first place in order to fund those purchases. That's right. Okay. But it means we're doing it right and yes. we're doing it on our terms without having to take unnecessary risks, without having to cut corners, mm -hmm. without doing things that dilute that vision and mission and purpose. So we're doing things right, but it just means people have to be a bit more patient with yes. us. But, you know, my, my dream is um, in five years time to not be the only provider doing it the way we do it. Yes. So I mentioned there's other shared ownership providers, yes. but they're prohibitively expensive, right? In the long run, yes. not in the short term. Um, but my dream is to actually power other providers to market, bring more and more providers into the market to increase capacity yes. so that in the future, in five, in the next five years, anytime someone wants to buy a home, they're not just thinking about Barclays and Halifax and, yes. you know, the, the sort of the mainstream, mainstream players. Lenders, yes. Actually, this genuine partnership based equitable approach is a mainstream offering. Yes. And my mission right now is to prove that it's a viable business opportunity. It can make money and it can be a, you know, a, a really good business. And now I'm actually getting to the point where other uh, major financial businesses are reaching out to us and saying, right, how do we do what you do? Mm. We want to enter the market. Can you help yes. us? And inshallah, we'll very soon be announcing our first partnership sure. where we're actually inshallah helping a major international Islamic bank enter the UK Islamic home finance market with our tech, with our property um, agreements. Yes. And we're actually rolling out their entire Islamic home finance division for them in the UK. Sure and that's exactly what I want to be yes. doing. And I want to be powering more and more providers into the market so that we get to the point where we've got more providers made, raising more capital from more different places in completely halal ways yes. and actually funding more and more homes. In five years time, if either is the only provider doing this, it doesn't matter if we're making a billion pounds per annum in profit, I have failed massively mm -hmm. as a founder. That's not my vision. My vision is to increase capacity, yes. create competition in the market. Right now we're the only ones doing it. Yes. That creates a massive amana upon me because I have to make sure I'm treating my customers fairly, yes. not because I'm forced to by competition, but because I know it's the right thing to do. Yes. That's a big test for me. I know, you know, when we survey our customers, um, one of the questions we ask them is, would you be willing to pay more for this product? Mm. And I kid you not, wallahi, 30%, 50% of respondents say I'd be willing to pay more. 30% mm. say, I don't care what you charge me. 30, that's, nice. that's the level of desperation yes. in our community, yes. right? Yes. And I get, uh, you know, the, the 100th home we completed earlier on in the year, we went and did a ribbon cutting ceremony with them. And the chap said to me, you know, Raza, I thought I would be renting for the rest of my life until I came across the Fyler model. And you have literally changed our family's yes. lives, right? Because there's no, there's no simple model for people to be able to get onto home ownership. This certainly is a, is a huge change in the market. And Islamic finance, we talk about, it's kind of gone through the phases in this country. Uh, you, it, it seems like we've had these step changes where we've had um, amazing changes and growth, but then nothing for years and years. That's right, that's right. And no evolution, no change. But I think maybe over the last 10 years, especially the development of a, a fintech and prop tech are starting to change that environment. Probably like, probably like over the last five years, to be yes. honest. But yeah, I mean, we have to give credit where credit's due to the Islamic banks. What they did was they came and introduced Islamic Finance version 1.0. And one of the major things they did 
was help starting to level the playing field because yes. the regulatory and tax regimes were never designed for Islamic offerings. Yes. So it was never a play, level playing field. And the Islamic banks have helped to level it. It's still not level, but it's yes. a lot better than it was yes. before. And that's all thanks to the banks. But what sadly then happened was once they entered the market, um, they just stopped innovating. Mm -hmm. So for the last 20 years, there's been no innovation in the yes. Islamic finance industry whatsoever. And now fintechs like by the and like there's several Islamic fintechs in the UK now doing really great work. Yes. I have to give a really big shout out to all my fellow Islamic fintech founders doing great work, mashallah. Sure. Um, and now what we're doing, our mission is to take Islamic finance to the next level and really reach that level of purity where there's no difference of opinion in the scholarly community yes. and where customers just get it, yes. right? Without because it's a simple model. You don't need a fatwa to yeah. have some peace of mind. Actually, this is great. You can see how simple and transparent the process is. Exactly. With our product, so we, we so as well as having an internal Sharia scholar, we have an external Sharia body yes. and they do the external Sharia certification. And I quite often say to my uh, partner, Salman, do we even need that external certification? Because our customers don't even look at it. Yes. They look at the model and they just instantly feel comfortable with it because it's just such a simple, yes. transparent, clear model. And you just know in your heart of hearts, there's no riba here. It's yes. just obvious, right? Yes. So, Rosa, the model that you use, what sort of label would you attribute to that? How would you describe it from a, an Islamic perspective? So, so the model we use is what's called a masharaka or a partnership model. Okay. Uh, and it's called a diminishing masharaka. So what that means is our partnership share diminishes as your partnership share yes. increases. But uh, a lot of diminishing masharaka models are based on debt, where you must buy my share from me. Okay. And that's what creates the issue because any... Uh, anything you pay on top of a monetary debt effectively replicates riba. Yes. With our model, there's no debt. You're not obli obligated to buy from us. It's yes. just like buying from a landlord. You decide if or when you want to buy from us. Yes. So that's a so the obligation model. isn't there. That's I there's guess no the obligation, aspect. no debt, and there's, therefore there's no two contracts in one. So how's that different from, say, some of the uh, traditional uh, Islamic finance institutions? So, so one of the key um, issues with Islamic banking on a global basis. Uh, is that it's really stagnated and there's no new innovation. But one of the biggest cons in Islamic finance, I, I think it is worth touching upon this, is a concept called commodity marabaha. Now, commodity marabaha is, um, it involves a fictitious sale of metals to try and get around the prohibition of lending with interest. Yes. And I'll give you a simple example. So let's say um, I own a piece of metal. Let's pretend this is a lump of metal, right? Yes. And I sell this metal to you. Um, for £100 cash. So you give me £100 cash. But you now immediately sell this metal back to me for £110 on the spot, immediately. Right. But you say to me, you know what, don't pay me £110 for this today. You can pay me in a year's time, right? Mm. So what have we done here? The metal has gone from me to you and then back to me again instantaneously. Yes. It's never even really exchanged hands. Yes. So that's actually fictitious. You can actually take the metal out of the equation. Nothing's really happened with yes. the metal. What's really happened is you've given me a hundred pounds cash today and said to me, give me 110 pounds in a year's yes. time. Yes. Now, ba basically that's a loan with interest. Yes. So, so you've, you've wrapped something, uh, you've introduced the, the metal in uh, just so there's a trade uh, there. Exactly. Because in the Quran, Allah says that trade is halal, yes. but interest is not, right? So what uh, these clever banking lawyers have done is said, well, let's introduce a trade into the equation. But the problem is the trade is fictitious. Yes. And actually for me, this is so fictitious and so insulting to Allah mm -hmm. because Allah said, don't, don't charge money on money. Yes. That is the definition, pure definition of riba. And what unfortunately a large segment of the Islamic banking industry around the world does, most of Islamic banking and Islamic finance around the world centers on this commodity marabah principle. Yes. What they're doing is saying, oh, no, no, don't worry, Allah. Mm -hmm. We're not lending with interest. We're doing a commodity trade. Mm -hmm. And it's like, do you think Allah is stupid? Yes. Do you think he doesn't see through what you're doing? Now, in principle, if I sell you a lump of metal for 100 quid, nothing wrong with that. Yes. If you sell me a lump of metal for 110 quid and give me time to pay, nothing wrong with that. Yes. They're actually two very halal contracts. Yes. But why did the Prophet Sallallahu say, don't combine two contracts of sale with one? Mm -hmm. Because this is what you get when you combine two contracts yes. of sale with them. You basically create riba. Yes. And that is why it's prohibited. And most, I would say 99.9% .9 of Islamic financial contracts in the world, whether they are commodity marabaha or whether they are diminishing musharaka with a debt 
or whether they are any type of um, contract, most Islamic finance contracts in the world very unfortunately rely on the principle of combining two contracts yes. of sale in one to get around the prohibition on riba. Yes. And that is the very, very sad state of affairs of Islamic finance today. And that is why we need not fida, but we need a hundred fidas. Yes. And we need a hundred other Islamic fintechs, actually thousands on a global basis, really taking Islamic finance to the next level, taking that debt out of the equation. Debt on its, by the way, I have to clarify, debt in itself isn't haram. There's a principle of debt in Islam called qadda hasana. Bank, um, many mosques use this yeah, to raise money. Well, you lend me money, but you don't charge interest on it. Yes. That is very halal. And actually, the loan is fine. It's the interest is the, the issue. interest, yes. which is haram, right? But the problem is when you're combining debt, yes. a debt-based obligation into a halal obligation, combining two contracts of sale in one, then you're creating riba on that debt. And that is the problem. And Islamic finance as an industry needs to now progress to the next yes. level. Okay, as a step one, the scholars allowed it because it's a step in the right direction and we need to make sure that Muslims have access to financial products. But now, 20 years on, there's no excuse. We need to be doing better. And this is why I want to be, uh, you know, bringing more and more of these types of products to market, inshallah. I think uh, Islamic finance is at that pivotal point right now where there's an opportunity for huge growth and innovation if people get behind what's already there. And I agree with you that uh, Islamic finance uh, 1.0 has not been perfect. But personally, I've used many of the different types of contract. I've used the uh, commodity uh, Marhaba one as well. And when I try to get my head around and try and understand it, and I, I have to say, I don't fully understand exactly how it's been put together because it's not easy to understand yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of how it's put together and the multiple contracts. Um, but my belief has always been it's better to try and support what's already there than work outside of what's there, if possible. But I think we are now at that point where actually we can change now to the to the yeah, next level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some scholars, and this isn't all scholars, I have to caveat, who say actually Islamic finance in its current form is worse than Riba mm -hmm. <laughs> because not only is it basically replicating the outcome yes. of Riba, but it's also in some respects trying to fool Allah, yes. which is terrible, right? Yes. It's, a, it's a completely heinous thing to do. Yes. So there are some scholars who are vehemently against the existing products. I totally see the rationale for the scholars who have signed off on the products because we need a stepping stone. We need a step in the right direction. And the detriment of not having any products for Muslims would be far greater. So I totally yes. see that rationale. But as you rightly say, we are now at the stage where as an Ummah, you know, if you think about our parents' generations, their responsibility when they came to this country was to set up the mosques and the madrasas yes. and the halal food restaurants. Yes. Our responsibility in our generation, we have the professional skill sets that we now have a responsibility to take these products to the next level. Absolutely. And there's no excuse for us to not yes. do it now. Yes. Raza, this has been a fascinating conversation, very educational uh, as well. And so may Allah SWT continue to bless you and put barakah in what you're, what you're doing on Fayda as well. And if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, so the best way is to visit our website, fida.com. So you can see the spelling, it's a bit weird, pfida.com. Uh, as I mentioned, the reason we put the P at the beginning is for people, because we like to always put people first, even if it makes our name spelling awkward. So fida.com, you can find out more about what we do. Uh, you can uh, reach out to our friendly team and arrange a call back and really just find out more. And feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you.